<laughs> okay. All right. So hello again. Um, our topic today for the webinar is project-based learning with real-world experiences with Mark Barnett. So before we begin, let me just go through what we're going to uh, discuss today. I'll give you a little introdu introduction about BSD education, um, and then I'll pass it over to Mark, and he will lead us through the different topics of what is PBL, um, designing PBL experiences, and then in the end, we have time for uh, Q&A, and also uh, we'll show you some sample projects connected with PBL today uh, uh, that we have on BSD online. So um, a little bit about BSD. Um, we are uh, we design and develop um, programs uh, for uh, teachers to bring digital skills into the classroom. So we focused on um, the creating the curriculum. We have our own platform, BSD Online, um, to host the curriculum, and we also provide PD and training and support. So we find that the combination of the three really brings um, a real impact um, and really helps support teachers. Um, in the ever-changing um, development of technology and how to bring it into the classroom to uh, make it meaningful for students. So I will pass it over to Mark um, and he will tell you a little bit about himself. Uh, thanks, Eva. Um, how about I'm just gonna, sh I'll share my screen, uh, but if you could uh, enable that so I can share and then I'll, I'll take it from there. Yep. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, thanks everyone. My name is Mark. Thanks for that introduction, Eva. Um, I currently oversee curriculum development and uh, establish how we develop curriculum at BSD. And because today's topic is about project-based learning, I'll explore and explain a little bit more about how we do that uh, with some examples. So all of our curriculum at, at BSD is kind of a project-based approach. So um, along with that, I oversee professional development, which is part of the webinar that you're seeing today. Um, and then also in my spare time, I am a PhD student at Chiang Mai University in Thailand, which is where I'm coming to you live from today. So um, I just want to kind of be clear that, uh, you know, in, in this webinar, in this short amount of time that we have together, uh, I can't really like give you everything you need to know about PBL. So what I've done is I've tried to kind of put as much information that's useful uh, for you in a short amount of time. But uh, if you're really interested in PBL and want to learn more about like how to actually conduct PBL in your school, I highly recommend you uh, dive deeper into some professional development. So um, a lot of people, you know, kind of wonder about, you know, do, does project-based learning have a formula or like, is there a set of processes or is there a set of um, tools? Uh, and the answer is kind of like yes and no, uh, because there's kind of like no right or wrong way to conduct a project, but there are some guidelines that can help you uh, design a unit of instruction. So I like to divide it up into four different sections. The first section is planning, where you know before you even uh, do any learning with students, you're gonna plan out the entire unit of instruction to the best of your ability. And since most of us are teaching subject areas which have standards, uh, whether you're a technology teacher and you're using ISTE standards, or you might be a math teacher and you're looking at Cambridge or IB or Common Core standards, we use those as uh, a starting point uh, for us to plan out a unit of instruction. The next thing we want to come up with is what we call a driving question. And a driving question is a question that will guide the rest of the learning. And a driving question isn't something that you can answer with Google or you can just you know, check Wikipedia real quick, but it's a deep and, and thought provoking question uh, which students will have to spend the rest of their time during the project trying to figure out how to answer that question. So that's the first step. 
Then when you introduce the project to the students, we call that the kickoff. And uh, typically, you know, with any lesson, you want to do some kind of an activity that uh, sparks interest. And so we call that an entry event. We're bringing students in, we're onboarding them with the necessary elements of the project, giving them the timeline, letting them know what, what the uh, deliverables are and how to complete the project with success. Once students have an idea about what the project is about, we're going to do an activity called the know and need to know. I'm, we're going to simulate that later today so you get an experience of what that feels like and an example. So then um, the rest of the project is you teaching the students what they need to learn and also the students working on the different elements of the project. So, uh, you know, if you're a math teacher, if you're, you're going to teach the math lessons that you would already be needing to teach, but now you're teaching them within the context of a project and it all relates to what students are going to build. If you're a technology teacher, you're going to teach what you are already planning to teach with the ISTE standards, but now it's wrapped up inside the project. Now, uh, towards the end of the working phase, once students have something to work with, let's say, for example, the students are uh, building a website. Uh, once they get a, a, a pretty good uh, working model of that website, they would want to get feedback from their friends and their peers about that so they can make uh, changes, additions, modifications, edits, so that um, you know, it, it's nice to kind of get that feedback from uh, their peers and also adults. So there's a protocol that we use called critical friends, and I'm going to demonstrate that today, and Eva will be the, the uh, critical friend. Uh, and uh, this is a really great practice because criticism is difficult, and uh, I'll, I'll talk more about it later. And then finally, uh, at the end, we want to be able to share what students have learned. So usually there's some kind of a presentation. It can be a formal presentation or it can be kind of a, a, more, uh, a less formal presentation, but it's always graded by a rubric. And also it's important to mention that that rubric is um, designed in the planning phase. So you wanna, in the, and when you're planning, you wanna design the rubric so that at the end students know how they're being graded. All right, so that's kind of you know, the structure of PBL in a nutshell. Uh, each of these elements has a lot more involved in it. So today I'm just gonna kind of hit on what I think are the most important parts. And um, hopefully you, you'll kind of get the picture of, of what that's like. I want to share with you an example of a real world experience. And that's kind of the title of this professional development is real world. And uh, I wrote a blog article about this that which you know we can probably send out in the email uh, in response to this if you haven't already read the blog post. But uh, I, I talk about what, what does it mean real world? That's kind of thrown around quite a bit. What does that actually mean real world? And to me, that means that if the students can answer the question, why are we doing this? then that's real world. If a student can't see the purpose of it and they don't understand why they're doing it, that's probably not going to affect them. They're not going to retain that knowledge and they're not going to put much effort into it. So uh, the picture you see on the left-hand side here, this is, is, an, is an example of a real world project that was conducted by high school students in the U.S. And uh, they, along with their math teacher, uh, their social studies teacher, uh, and, and several other members of the community, built actual houses. And these houses were being used to provide homes for low income people in the, in the area. So the students uh, learned about uh, construction methods. They learned about how to read blueprints. They learned how to use equipment, saws, drills, hammers, electrical equipment. Uh, they learned the entire process from how to lay the foundation to how to erect the walls, how to put the electricity in, uh, how to finish the house. They learned about um, the community needs for people and, and why the housing crisis is such a big problem in different parts of the US. Uh, they got to be there when the, when the family moved into the house. So they got to see it from start to finish and every element of it was real world. So um, it, it's not always easy as a teacher to give students this kind of opportunity. And, I, and I'm not suggesting that this is the only way to do project-based learning is to go build houses. It's just a, a pinnacle example. So in project-based learning, you can kind of do, uh, you know, very tactical real world experiences, but if you can't do that and you don't have the means to, you can do a simulation of this, which is just as powerful. And so a simulation of this would be that students would uh, learn the same skills, but they're going to maybe just build a scale model of that. And then they would uh, share that scale model with community members and uh, lear learn all the same things along the way.
So uh, the bullet points I have here is that, you know, with, with project-based learning, uh, the goal is for the students to discover that they themselves need to learn a new skill in order to be successful on the project, which means it's going to be relevant. As the teacher, if you can make the learning local, uh, you know, by working on projects that are relevant to things that are going on in your local communities, you know, and things that are happening in the news, and students need to see how it directly applies to themselves and to their own lives. So this is just an example. Uh, I'm not saying that if to do to do project based learning, you have to do these extravagant uh, big projects, but uh, I wanted to show you an example of, of what is possible, given the right materials and resources and uh, uh, planning. So um, there's been over 10 years, possibly 15 years worth of research about project based learning to show that it's an effective strategy. Um, so uh, Eva, there's a link uh, if people want to read, you know, the, the full research papers about this, but I've summarized the, the main points here. Uh, project based learning has been shown through research that it helps to increase long term retention of content as compared to traditional education methods. Uh, two, it helps students perform as well or better on high stakes tests. Uh, three, it helps students with problem solving skills and collaboration skills, which I think is a huge important piece. It's one of those 21st century skills that students need to carry on into high school or into college and into the, the job places. Uh, four, it improves attitudes towards learning, which means that students are more interested in learning. They care about it. They're, one thing that's not listed here is that uh, students tend to show up every day, uh, so their, their uh, attendance rates are going up because the attitude is shifting towards learning. And then lastly, uh, project-based learning can provide an effective model for whole school reform. So th the magic really happens when a school commits to project-based learning in every section of the, of the school. And uh, there, there's examples of, of these types of schools around the world. Um, Eva, have you, have you ever heard of High Tech High? Yes. High Tech High is a the school out in the California, and uh, they're I think they're probably one of the first and most famous schools for for doing project based learning. And a lot of the research that's been conducted has been at, at those schools and the accompanying schools now that um, have grown out from that one. And uh, you know there's schools all over the world now uh, who have taken this on as a as a full way of learning. So um, one thing I, I want to just mention quickly here is that there, there is a difference between just doing a project and doing project-based learning. One example would be, let's say you're a science teacher and uh, you teach, you, you, you need to teach about plate tectonics. It's one of the popular topics in earth science in middle school. Uh, so typically you might, you know, read some stuff in a book, watch a video, et cetera. And then at the end, the teacher lets you build a diorama model of plate tectonics. And so technically that is doing a project, but it's not project-based learning per se, because project-based learning is meant to encompass the entire uh, elements of teaching from start to finish, not just something you do at the end that looks cool and gives the time for the kids to play and make something. Uh, I'm not saying that's not an effective way to teach, but it's not really encompassing uh, the true model of project-based learning. So um, in order to do project-based learning, it requires a bit of a paradigm shift in the way that you think about teaching and the way that you approach learning from the perspective of a teacher, which means that you have to start out from day one, planning the project out so that the project is part of the learning and not what you do at the end of the learning. All right, so I've, I've kind of given you uh, this kind of you know, quick and dirty uh, vision of what project-based learning is. So now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, some more examples and the specifics of designing project-based learning experiences. So um, I, I chose some uh, you know, run of the mill, I, I chose grade six standards because you know, sometimes we have primary teachers coming in, sometimes we have high school teachers coming in. So I thought sixth grade, middle of the road uh, standards. So um, the, I, I picked out three, from three different subjects, social studies, writing, and science. And these are just copy and paste verbatim from common core standards of US curriculum. So I, I want you to, I'll read these out loud I'll, because it's important that you understand the content of these because what we're gonna do next is uh, walk you through how we could possibly take these standards and turn them into a project. 
So social studies says students analyze the geographic, political, economic, religious, and social structures of er early civilizations, such as the Greeks, Roman, and Egyptians. Grade six writing use narrative writing techniques such as dialogue, pacing, and description to develop experiences, events, and or characters. Grade six science describe how plate tectonics causes major geologic events such as ocean basin formation, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and mountain building. So whether you teach these subjects or not really is important. But what I want you to think about is um, how can these subjects and how can these standards all weave together to start to create some kind of a project. And so as a teacher, um, what I really like about project-based learning is it allows me to be creative and, 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 and weave these elements together. Eva, uh, from, from the grade six social studies, uh, do, you, do you remember uh, at all from your own personal uh, education studying about this topic, about you know, the ancient civilizations? Yes. Actually, you, that was one of one of my favorites. <laughs> okay. Do you remember any 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 interesting facts about uh, ancient civilization? Not particularly, but what really stood out was making models <clears throat> um, of architect Greek architecture. Um, okay. For Egyptians, we were like making the death masks, and I remember a lot of like hands-on building and doing. <laughs> Now I'm I'm going to assume here that probably the the way that you learned was through the 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 project at the end of the learning type of experience where you would read about it, learn about it, and then mm. make something, right? Yeah, I remember yeah. there were trips to like the library, and then the teachers would be like, "Go oh, take a look at the books. Here's what you're trying to um, find out," and then yeah, yeah. So those are powerful experiences. And like you said, you know, those are the things that you remember the most is when you are doing something hands-on. So it's not wrong per se to do a project at the end of the learning, but if you're really interested in those effects that the research shows, if you want to have high test scores, you wanna have in change attitudes towards learning, then you know, doing the whole project from the beginning and encompassing the learning through the project is the only way to get those results. All right, so um, hopefully you had a minute to kind of digest those standards and think about um, how could we possibly weave together uh, these concepts into a project. And so a lot of times in project-based learning, we also um, want teachers to work across subject areas. So in, in some places, a sixth grade teacher might be all encompassing in the same classroom where they are teaching all these subjects. Other times, this might end up being three different teachers who are working together and all become experts in you know, their subject areas who collaborate together on this one project. All right, so on the next page, I'm gonna show you an idea that I came up with that weaves together all of these uh, standards. And it's also gonna show you the elements that you need to um, plan a project-based learning unit of instruction. So the idea that I came up with that covers all three of the standards, uh, I mentioned earlier that a PBL unit of instruction has to have a driving question. And the driving question is that question that all of the learning points back towards. It should be provocative. It should be something that uh, requires you to think and it requires you to have to actually learn something to answer the question. So the driving question I came up with is, how have modern and ancient societies benefited from the natural resources around them and failed because of natural disaster. So if you really think about that, that's a, that's a big open question that, that, would, that would require us to uh, think carefully and look at examples and dig into the history. Now to, to kind of further elaborate on the project, the, the full description is um, the Minoan earthquake in 1600 BC was one of the largest disasters ever. How did the Greek people recover from it and what caused the earthquake? How have other societies planned for natural disasters since? All right, so you know, based on the standards, we're tying together the, um, the social studies elements and the science elements together, and that's very clear. But the writing elements, maybe we have to go into a little bit more detail here, which is why I've come up with three project deliverables for this unit of instruction. The first project deliverable is that students have to write a dramatized first person account of the Minoan earthquake that would meet the needs of the writing uh, standard. So each student would have to do this. Um, the second deliverable is a presentation. So this is where students would work in a group. 
Uh, they would make a presentation of what civilizations have done to be safe from natural disaster since the Minoan earthquake. And I put the word presentation in quotation marks there because it doesn't necessarily have to be a PowerPoint or a Google slide deck. I think a presentation can be any way for students to share what they've learned. They want to they want to make a video. They want to build a website. They want to build a model. They want to you know um, do a dance a puppet show. It's totally up to them. Uh, and then lastly, in groups, students must build a model depicting how plate tectonics work. And once again, model is in parentheses because a model could be physical, could be made out of clay, could be a digital model, could be something that they 3D printed, it could be something that's in virtual reality, totally up to the students. And another important part of project-based learning is that you want to allow for students uh, the flexibility to show their learning. Uh, so when you say presentation, that means that they have multiple ways to show their learning. All right, so I've covered the science standard, I've covered the social studies standard, I've covered the writing standard, and now this project sounds a little bit more interesting and inviting, and, and students have to kind of dig in to answer the question. So otherwise, you know, in traditional educational settings, students would uh, probably read a book, you know, about the Greeks and the Romans and Egyptians, and maybe they'd watch some videos, and maybe at the end they would, uh, you know, build something. But I think this is much more enriching and it provides a context for student learning. So this is just my example. There are lots of other examples. You know, anybody could have taken these three standards and turned them into any other similar or related project. So like I mentioned earlier, I think that's a powerful thing about project-based learning is it allows the teacher to really be creative with the curriculum and the development of the project. All right, so um, I mentioned in, earlier in the, in the, um, the three different, or the, the, the different phases of the project, which is planning, then we've got uh, the entry events or the engage, and then we've got uh, the actual project itself. So I, I want to share with you a little bit about how we would do the entry or the engage, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example project, okay? So imagine that you are the student, uh, and Eva, you can be my student, uh, and anyone else who's watching can be the student. Imagine you're the student and I'm the teacher and I'm giving you this project to work on. All right, here's the prompt for the project. I want you to design a 30 second public service announcement, which is you know, a film that you have to you know, shoot and edit for Cambodian children about the benefits of eating a plant-based diet because access to high quality meats have declined. Uh, in the in the country, so there's less and less access to meats of high quality. So you know we could solve this problem by thinking about plant-based diets, and we actually want to make a video that Cambodian children would watch. Okay, so if that's the project prompt, uh, the next question I want to ask you, Eva, is um, what 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 would you need to learn uh, in order to be successful with this? As a student, I think first, how do I make a film? <laughs> exactly. What equipment I'll need. Yeah. Um, I might not know what public service announcements are. Um, I'll probably need examples of those. Um, I might want to find more, uh, find out more about, do some research into Cambodia. Might mm. not, don't know much about it. Um, maybe then look into the science, um, or maybe like what people eat in Cambodia, what's the food culture there currently. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then a lot a lot of digital, like research, online research as well. Um, yeah. And I guess a question I will have as a student is like, do I do this by myself or do I, do I have a team or can I work in a group for it? Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and so this activity, um, is called the know and the need to know. So once I deliver the prompt and I tell students about what the, the main objective is, what's the driving question, et cetera, we're gonna do this activity called the know and the need to know. So Eva, you, you um, did a good job just like you know, students would have done. So here on this slide is uh, an example of a know and need to know that I conducted with students. And so uh, this was done during a virtual class so we use Google Jamboard and it's very simple. I just did a T chart on the left hand side is what do you already know? And then on the right hand side is what do you need to learn? So the, the important part of this activity is that we, um, we're, we're going to listen to the learner and we're going to acknowledge what they already know about the subject. 
And, and so we, we have to realize that, that we have a, you know, a variety of different students in our classroom with varying levels of knowledge. So a few students, and each of these th sticky notes is from a different student. So one student says, I know how to edit videos. Another student says, I visited Cambodia. Another student says, my sister is vegan. And another one says, I know people need protein. So we acknowledge that the students have some knowledge about this subject already. So later, when we get into the learning, I'm gonna call on these students to help us sh share that knowledge. So when, it, when it's time for us to edit videos, I'm gonna call the student to help, help us, uh, you know, what do we need to know to learn about uh, editing videos? So I'm, gonna, I'm going to invite th that student to join as part of the, the learning and teaching process. Now, the next thing, uh, the, the what do we need to learn, this is actually psychologically the most powerful element of project-based learning because what it does is it takes the ownership of learning out of my hands as a teacher and it puts it into the student's hands. Because in typical education, it's me, the teacher, who's telling you what to learn every day. You know, we write it on the board. Today, I will learn about blah, 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 all right? But instead, I'm giving you the prompt and now you as a student are saying, I need to learn this, I need to learn that, I need to learn this, just like Eva said. All of the things that Eva mentioned are similar to what students said here. I might need to learn about video editing. I might need to learn about Cambodian diets and tradition. I might need to learn about you know, uh, diets and uh, food that people need. I might need to learn about price availability for food in Cambodia currently. I, need, I might need to learn about resources that are available in Cambodia. So these are all um, items that students generated. So now during the course of the rest of the learning, um, I'm going to lead students through answering all of these questions. Uh, so instead of me telling the students what they have to do, the students are telling me what they need to learn in order to be successful on this project. So it's a, it's a very subtle but very powerful psychological shift, and it empowers students because they have the authority to ask for learning to happen instead of for learning to be uh, told uh, on them. Um, so th this is a pretty easy to pull off exercise, but when you first do it, you might not get many answers. Uh, and that's been my experience. Is if I'm working with a new group of students and they've never done this activity and I ask them, well, what do we need to learn? They're like, I don't know, you tell me, you're the teacher because they're so used to this model of the teacher always telling them what to learn. So I I've developed a, a method of probing questions. And so I, I would ask, you know, if, if, if no one says anything, I will say, okay, well, you know, the prompt says we need to make a video. Uh, does everyone here know how to make a video? And I see head shaking. And so then I say, okay, do you think we should put on here that we need to learn how to make a video? And I use the word we. Uh, and then everyone kind of agrees, or I might ask them to raise their hands or whatever. And I'll say, okay, great. I'm going to put that on here. We need to learn how to use video editing. Okay. So I'm inviting the students to that. I'm still not telling them that they have to. Uh, but because of the probing, I'm, I'm getting students to kind of bring that voice up. Over time, once I've done this activity several times, students are just constantly you know, giving me answers here and telling me what they need to learn to be successful. So that's just a little teaching tip. <clears throat> All right, so um, after you've generated the list of what students are going to need to learn, this is when you as the teacher are gonna teach all the stuff that you already had planned to teach. So this, the example with the Cambodian children uh, was probably you know, a health teacher, for example. And so the health teacher already had to teach about nutrition, already had to teach about resources, already had to teach about all those things that were in their standards, but now they're doing it through the lens of the project. So the teacher is gonna use their resources, their textbooks, their videos, all of the teaching materials that they already have, but now it's a part of the project. But what this does allow for is that it allows for a natural approach to differentiated instruction, okay? Because if I, if, I, if I go back to this, I see that I've got some students that know how to edit videos and I've got some students that don't know how to edit videos. So now, me as the teacher, I'm not gonna ask every student to sit down and go through a lesson about video editing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, hey guys, on Friday, I'm gonna host a mini workshop for anybody who wants to learn more about video editing. Come if you need it. If you don't need it, please continue working on your project. So then I'm differentiating naturally based on the student's needs and abilities, and I'm not wasting anyone's time who already knows how to edit videos, all right? So this allows you to kind of work with small groups. It allows you to elicit things that, that some students don't have. It allows you to acknowledge uh, the strengths that other students have. 
And I, I find that project-based learning is the best way for our teachers to flow in and out of differentiated instruction environments. And so this is where all of the teaching happens. So this is the bulk of the project. You've got the planning phase, you've got the intro phase, and now this is where you know, we're actually teaching, we're actually learning, we're doing all the work, et cetera. All right, so let's imagine, you know, my students that, uh, you know, you've been working on this Cambodian video project, you've learned about nutrition, you've learned about the diet, you've learned about the natural resources, and you've started to put together a first draft of your video, okay? So what, what I would want students to do is uh, share their videos with their peers, and their peers would give feedback. But the way that we give feedback needs to be uh, in, in a safe environment, all right, because Criticism is often seen as a negative thing because people use criticism in negative and hurtful ways. And most of us have experienced that and it doesn't feel good. But we need to realize that criticism has a powerful way to help us grow and to help us learn. So we formulate feedback in a formula that's called the critical friends protocol. And the way that you provide feedback is, first of all, you have to say, I like dot, dot, dot. So whatever, whatever it is you're looking at, you say, I like dot, 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 then to kind of formulate the, the negative or, or the criticism, you say, I wonder, dot, 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 or you can say, have you thought of, all right? So you have to say, I like first, then you can choose to say either, I wonder, or have you thought of. And the way that I introduce this activity to students before they um, actually try this out with their own student work is we do a fun little activity called the art critic, okay? So I show students a piece of artwork and I ask them to criticize the art, imagining that the artist is standing right in front of them and they have to say, I like dot, 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 or I wonder, have you thought of? And so Eva, I'm gonna put you on the spot and you are gonna be the art critic today. And uh, on the next slide, I'm gonna show you some art, okay? And I want you to imagine that the artist is here on the call with us and you're gonna give the artist feedback, but you're gonna stick to the formula. You're gonna say, I like, but I wonder, mm, dot, dot, dot. Okay, and you're not gonna say, oh my God, this sucks, what are you thinking, All right? Because that's the negative version you know, that, that, that is harmful and hurtful to people, which makes them afraid of criticism. And we're trying to grow a culture where criticism is acceptable. And so we have to model this and we have to stick to the uh, protocol. Eva, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna show you the artwork. I'm gonna you know, take about three to five seconds to soak it in and, and, and think about what you're gonna say in your mind. And then, you know, just give the feedback, imagining that the artist is here on the call. Okay? Yeah. All right, here What's we go. Expect? All right. <laughs> uh, here it is. Okay. Okay, yeah, what's your feedback? <laughs> I like the different use of um media in this mm -hmm. um but i wonder um if some of the colors can for example the cloud um mm. i wonder if that might look unclear to the viewer uh, to the audience um have you thought of maybe adjusting the color of that yeah. cloud? <laughs> no, all right, very good, good job, perfect. And um, what, what, what I like about this art critic activity is that I purposely choose a piece of artwork that's kind of like, whoa, okay, uh, because it, it immediately kind of leaves you speechless. And you're like, what am I gonna say about this? Uh, and, um, but, 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 but that puts you in a spot where you have to you know, turn off that, that first reaction and then formulate a, a clarified response uh, that, that, that can actually be useful to someone, okay? So uh, when we're doing this with students for the first time, I, I, I find little funny pieces of art like this and you know, it, it's always you know, interesting to see what students say about it and we have a little bit of fun with it. Um, but when it comes time for students to actually criticize each other's work, uh, then you know we take it a little bit more seriously, but I find that starting off with this low stakes, low threshold entry point with the uh, feedback uh, kind of uh, sets the stage and it, it gives people a chance to try it out. 
Now, sometimes I even go a step further and um, I ask students uh, to become fashion critics. So first, you know, the, we start off with the art and the artist isn't real, the artist isn't in the room. But to, to up the ante a little bit, I ask students to pair up, stand in front of each other, and then I ask them to criticize their fashion. All right, so I, you know, I, 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 like, I like that you're wearing a, a professional button up shirt, Mr. Mark, but I wonder why you decided to wear flip-flops with that outfit. You know, so that's, that's I mean, it, it, it's still a little bit playful, it's still a little bit fun, but now we're actually facing someone. And so that, that, that creates that, that sense of, of connection and uh, people you know, will, will listen and, and be a part of that. So feedback is a culture and we have to cultivate that culture. And so having the formula, I like, I wonder, have you thought of, helps to keep that all in place. Uh, at schools that I've worked with in the past, the uh, critical fans formula has worked so well that I've even overheard students on the playground using the I like, I wonder feedback to each other. Uh, so it's, it's a powerful way for us to accept feedback. All right, so I would say that in every project, you would wanna provide at least one opportunity for students to share their work and get criti criti criticism back on it. Then students get a chance to edit for the final presentation. Uh, and so um, this is, you know, everything I've shared so far is this, this you know, really quick and short version of project-based learning. And I've, and I've tried to share with you elements of project-based learning that I think you could implement right away without having to do the whole project, without having to go to three days of professional development. So any of the things that I shared today, you can implement into any project, whether it's at the end of the learning or in the middle or whatever. But if you're on this journey of project-based learning, uh, here are three questions you can start to ask yourself. One is, how can I provide more voice and choice for students? Which means how can students uh, ha have a say in what they produce? So like I mentioned earlier, when I say presentation in quotation marks or model in quotation marks, that gives students a lot of voice and choice about what they actually make. Uh, second question is, how can I differentiate learning for each student? And so uh, I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, whenever we do the know and the need to know, it's a good way to start that process of differentiating. And then lastly, based on what you know so far, based on your situation and how you want to intimate, uh, how you want to implement project-based learning, where do you need help? Uh, and uh, maybe that means you need uh, help from your principal to get you on the right track, or maybe you need professional development, or maybe uh, you need your whole staff or your whole team to work with you. That's up to you. But uh, yeah, I think that's it for project-based learning uh, that, that I had planned to share for today. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Eva, who's going to share at BSD, how we have some sample projects that uh, use the project-based learning approach and a little bit more about how you can use some of our products and services at BSD. And then at the end, we'll leave time for some uh, Q and A. Great, thank you, Mark. There's a lot of little pieces that we can bring into the classroom um, very quickly. Um, so in terms of Q and A, uh, please leave your questions in the chat box and um, we will get to it in the end. Um, so as Mark said, I will show you some of the projects that we have at BSD. So this is our multi-page website. And um, instead of just um, kind of teaching the students about um, empathy, um, isolated on its own or like communities, um, we introduced it through uh, the multi-page website. So um, our multi-page website project um, then allows for students to explore um, local community organizations and um, different um, ways to use technology to support your local communities um, in, uh, that's relevant to them. Another way is um, through video game design. So kids, of course, they'll get really excited when you say, okay, let's, let's make a video game or um, let's learn how to code a game. But there's more to that. Um, throughout the unit for our video game design course, um, we ask questions to students of what makes a great game, and this allows them to look deeper into the gaming industry and actually learn more about the industry itself and the skills and the and the um, and the type of games there are out there and what makes it good. What what makes you engage with with a certain game? So we lead um, with a lot of these different types of interesting projects, 
um, but allowing students the opportunity to look into um, different uh, topic areas and industries. So there are three main ways you can bring BSD into your school. Um, we have uh, some free projects that's available to um, all teachers and schools and students um, that uh, can be accessed. Um, Mark, if you don't mind um, sharing the link to that um, well, for the yeah. free, free page. Um, and then we also have Teach and Build. Um, Teach is our single teacher plan um, where a teaching teacher can um, subscribe and have access to uh, for up to 30 students um, to our library of content. Um, for the full um, experience, uh, we offer 600 plus hours of certified curriculum across different areas of digital skills and digital learning. Um, and this is all supported through um, our PD um, coaching, uh, continuous coaching with our um, with our team and also live chat support for you in the classroom. So here are the three main ways. Um, please reach out anytime if you have any questions or uh, or if you're interested to know more. So yep, this is these are some of the free projects. Um, they're all really fun and engaging. Uh, and Marcus shared the link. So now uh, your feedback for these webinars is very important to us. Uh, there's a feedback form which Mark will link into the chat box. So if you have a moment after this webinar, please feel free to um fill it out and uh send it back to us thank you so much and now we're ready for questions all right so to start us off we have um one question here okay. um can you do pbl virtually uh, yes, yeah. So the uh, the example project that I mentioned of the uh, Cambodian uh, health and nutrition was a, it was an example of a, a virtual project that we conducted with students. Uh, so students, uh, you know, learned how to video edit. They learned about the health and nutrition. They produced their own videos, uh, and then we even had a uh, a partnership with a, a school in Cambodia uh, to review those videos and provide the critical fans feedback. So this was an example of a simulation because the videos weren't ever actually shown like on the, the Cambodian public uh, TV network or anything, but, but the students you know, had this valuable learning process along the way. So I, I find that you know, especially you know, technology projects are easy to conduct virtually, but um, over, over the past couple of years of COVID, I've seen amazing examples of PBL being done virtually all over the world. And I think the virtual environment allows for um, those key moments of like uh, isolated teaching and workshops work really well, um, where students just log in if they need that extra help or learn about the next uh, a tool or skill. So that has worked really well for, for me personally when I do uh, classes with students online. Um, another question we have is, is PBL only for tech subjects? Uh, no, PBL is really for any subject, and uh, it's for any grade level. And so there, there are different ways that you can um, conduct projects for middle school students versus high school students. You know, and it's, it's mostly based around the expectations for their ability to, to uh, stay uh, with a topic for a long period of time. For example, you, you wouldn't expect second graders to do a six week long project on the same subject because their attention span isn't you know, uh, gonna last that long, but high school students certainly can. So it's more about being flexible for the need of the students and less about the subject area. But in order to conduct project-based learning successfully and to implement all of the elements, I highly recommend uh, that anyone uh, you know, get a little bit more professional development uh, and uh, you know, attend some trainings and get some support from other teachers but uh, the most important element uh, in my years of helping schools implement project-based learning is that uh, at somewhere in the leadership, there should be you know, some support. So if, if you're just one teacher by yourself trying to do project-based learning, but everyone else around you is doing the traditional learning model, it's gonna be very difficult for you, not impossible, but uh, challenging for sure. But if you're at a school where the principal and other members of leadership are supporting of this, helping with professional development, 
helping with the schedule, helping to bring students together, then uh, project-based learning can really flourish. So uh, it depends on your unique situation. All right, great. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm just aware of time. Um, we are two minutes over. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Mark, for sharing your expertise in the area. Um, so if you have any questions for us or, or want to get in touch, um, you can find us on uh, bsc.education um, as well. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Yep. Thank you. Cheers.